So I had another one of those weird weeks where I prepared a sermon and then um, decided I wanted to do something else, and I didn't know what I wanted to do, and so I said, well, let's do one of your favorite passages. And here's how you know the Holy Spirit's involved when worship services are being put together, because tonight I want to talk about a funeral. And what did we just sing about? Somebody getting ready for a funeral. And this funeral happens in, in Luke chapter 7, verse 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. And as he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. So you see this happening here. We got a crowd coming this way and a crowd coming that way. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, do not weep. Then he came up, touched the coffin, and the bearer stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. And fear seized them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And the report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. This is, yeah, hallelujah indeed. So <clears throat> I was in the Medigo Valley, Megiddo Valley, and as you're leaving, there's this long, skinny road, and at, way down that road is the city of Nain, where this happened. And it's a nowhere place to be, unless, of course, you've read Luke 7, and then you really want to go there, you know. I said to the guy, can't we go there? I want to see where it happened. No, there's nothing to see. Well, you don't understand. <laughs> Something happened there, and, and, and I want to be a part of this. I'm with this guy who retired. He literally retired like two weeks ago. <clears throat> and so I, I'm with him and I, I said, so what are you gonna do now that you retired? He says, I'm gonna get ready to die. <laughs> I'm like, what? Did you miss the point of retirement? He goes, well, nobody in my family lives long. None of the guys live long and so. I said, why do you speak this over yourself, okay? Obviously, you haven't met Jesus. And let's just feel this woman's experience. She's lost her husband, and now she has to bury her only son. Twice, death has reached its icy fingers into her life and wrenched the ones she loved away from her. And she's already facing an uncertain future with the loss of the breadwinner of her household, her husband, and now she faces it alone. Nobody in the household. No hand to hold. No one to wake up in the morning to make breakfast for. Nobody to tuck in at night. No one to celebrate the future with. No one to look after her in the autumn years. No one. Nothing remains but an empty shell of a house. No animated conversations, just silent, still air with grief flowing from room to room. And now she's leading the procession to bury her past, present, and future. Well, as the coffin leads a crowd out of town, another crowd is entering the town. Jesus and the multitude that follows him. Two different crowds meeting at the city gates. It's a collision of death and life on both sides of the, the gates. And no doubt, out of respect for the dead, <clears throat> the multitude entering into the city are going to back out of the way. I mean, that's the way it ought to be. A funeral procession takes precedence. I mean, after all, we tend to give death respect. We, we move aside. Funerals have a way of sobering us up. How much time do I have left on earth? Uh, what will my legacy be? What's the pastor going to say about my life? Okay. And for an extra 20 bucks, I can say something nice. Okay? 
am I next? You know, I thought I was all tough. Oh, I'm going to be with the Lord. And then I had this pain. And I read in the, the uh, Facebook that, you know, this is how it starts. You know? <laughs> and fear gripped me. And I'm like, oh, you are such a phony. You know, you're all talking tough. And you get a little pain in the backside and you get scared. And, and in many ways, we're all part of the procession. You know, from the first family when... when Cain murdered Abel to the last person who dies before Jesus comes back. You know, all living souls are headed to the cemetery. The reach of death, it touches all of us. It shatters dreams. It ends relationships. It, it causes tears. It's a train of misery that all of us must ride. And, and people get freaked out about cemeteries and death. You know, back in college, I had a roommate, a Christian roommate, we were in the same ministry together, and he would always go out drinking and come back at two in the morning, and, you know, he'd never invite me, so I was irritated, and um, so one night, he's out doing his thing, and, and I lived in Boulder, Colorado, and I lived Kitty Corner across from the old Boulder Cemetery, okay, all the old graves, and, you know, a lot of them had fallen over, and so, you know, I grab one of the graves, I go into the cemetery, I put it over his bed, you know, <laughs> and I just wait. <laughs> sure enough, just like clockwork, he comes stumbling into the house at 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, jumps into bed, and you hear a thud, you know, and what? And he wakes up and turns the light on and then sees this, this tombstone over his bed and screams like a baby and runs out of the room, you know. <laughs> I thought it was funny, okay. <laughs> he really literally never spoke to me again. You know, a Duke professor, Dan Airely, in his book, The Honest Truth About Dishonesty, says, over the course of many years of teaching, I've noticed that there seems to be a rash of deaths among students' relatives at the end of the semester. It happens mostly in the week before final exams and when papers are due. And guess what relative dies the most? Grandma. Okay. <laughs> Uh, grandmas are 10 times more likely to die before a midterm and 19 times more likely to die before a final exam. <laughs> and, and worse, grandmothers of students who are not doing well are even at a higher risk. <laughs> students who are failing are 50 times more likely to lose grandma than students who are not failing. <laughs> okay? The greatest predictor of mortality among senior citizens in our day is our children's GPAs. So of all the deaths, there's truly nothing more wrong than the death of a child. In Carl Jung's word, it's the period placed before the end of the sentence. You know, we expect the old to die, and, you know, the separation is, is difficult when somebody young dies. Um, you know, a, a child with all of its potential before them gets struck down, and usually when you die, there's pain involved that makes the whole thing all the worse, and... and, and it's devastating. At my second church that I served, this man had lost his son when his son was 18. It was decades earlier. And if you ever had a conversation with him longer than seven minutes, he brought it up. Okay? He never got over it. That conversation happened all the time. It's something you don't get over. And did you notice in our story that Jesus doesn't move aside for the funeral? He's not concerned with protocol and etiquette. He doesn't care what the rabbinic rules say, that if you touch a coffin, you're going to be made unclean. He has no respect for death. Okay, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, Jesus came that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So guess what? If you're scared to die, you don't have to be scared anymore. I just want you to feel that, hear that, receive that, and rest in that. To live is Christ and to die is gain. 
You know, Jesus, he sees this woman's tears and he focuses on her shattered heart. He sees her desperation. He feels his pain. Here's the eternal son of God who identified himself as the son of man, choosing to emphasize his connection to us rather than his eternal identity. And what does he do? He feels our pain. He cried for his friend Lazarus. Okay, He knows what a painful poison death is in our lives. And his only concern is for the despondent mom. Jesus looks into her eyes and says, don't cry. Now I'm just telling you in our pastoral uh, pamphlets of how we're supposed to care for those in grief, don't cry is not one of the statements you're supposed to make. Okay, It's the wrong statement. And in the midst of our life losses, there's lots of religious words that that really don't work. I I remember when I had um, leukemia back in 2000, people would come up to me and, and, well, you know, William, we're all going to die someday. (laughs) Thanks, buddy. (laughs) So it looks like your sins have caught up to you, you know. Yeah, Yeah, it's kind of you. Thank you, you know. Do you think you're going to make it to heaven? You know, well, I'd mind to get there before you, obviously, you know. <laughs> you know, people say stupid things when, when they're facing, we're facing death, you know. And a lot of people think it's a divine punishment. If you wouldn't have done that thing way back when. And I've known people who all their lives lived in fear of something that they did 40, 50 years ago already been forgiven and forgotten by the Lord, and these people keep it alive and and, and worry that this is going to separate them from heaven. Okay? I want to remind you, if you have somebody who's hurting, the best thing you can do is be a compassionate ear. Don't try to go into philosophical mode. You know, the the thing that people want most is just somebody to sit next to them and and, and listen and, 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 you know... That's, that's, that's the number one thing people want. Uh, the Lord says, do not cry because Jesus is the one who would suffer the wages of sin, which are death. Jesus received the death sentence that every sinner destined for the grave deserves. Not only does Jesus take away the cause of death, but conquer death in its totality by rising from the tomb where he was buried. Listen to Romans 14.9. For this very reason Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. I want you to feel this, the dead and the living. He's the Lord of the dead and the living. And and we always think, you know, um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those guys used to be, right? And when God introduces himself to Moses, he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, these guys are still alive as far as God is concerned. And the Lord makes that radical statement, young man, I say to you, get up. And I wonder how many times the Lord said to us, get up, quit graveling before me. You asked forgiveness for this a long time ago. I forgave it. I'm now waiting for you to receive the forgiveness and get up and let's move forward together. I wonder how many times we get ourselves in a a mess of a relationship or our bad habits keep causing us to fall or we have some emotional pain that ends our dreams and we die right there. And Jesus is probably saying, get up. You're not dead. You're just having a bad day. So you had a bad season. You made a huge mistake. My life it's a future and a hope for you. And I don't know where you are right now. I don't know what you're holding on to. I don't know what you're struggling against. I don't know what you've given up on. Guess what? Get up. Because there's life for whatever deadly virus, dead end habit, dead attitude that you've brought into your life. Listen to this. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Will Mayo, Mayo Clinic, okay? He says, I've seen patients that were dead by all standards, that we knew they could not live. And I've seen ministers come to the bedside and do something for them that I could not do. People were as good as dead, 
And when faith comes along, guess what happens? Life gets released. Dr. D.L. Moody, he was, uh, was going to do his first funeral, so he goes, well, I'm going to see what the Bible says about funerals, see how Jesus handled funerals, and he didn't get anywhere because every time Jesus confronted a dead person, he raised him back to life. In fact, even at his own death, his own funeral, he raised himself back to life, you know? And I do funerals, I'm doing one Saturday, and I always think, oh, if only Jesus would hear. If Jesus was here, you know, let me tell you something. And I'll tell you this weird story. One time I'm in the middle of preaching, and um, the person in the front row moans and, and collapses, and his wife just shrieks. And so I'm literally preaching here, this happens over there, so I come down and I pray, I invite the congregation to pray, and I pray over this person, and they revive, and I go back off and continue on in my message, you know. And so later in the week, this woman comes up to me, and she was a nurse, and she goes, Pastor, you're not going to, you don't know this, but I felt this pulse, and there wasn't one. He was dead. So I'm thinking, whoa. Okay. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> I mean, think about this, you know? Uh, I remember one job interview, and this guy asked me, so how many people have you led to the Lord? And I'm, I'm, I said, well, I, I, I was under the impression that we weren't supposed to be counting numbers, okay? 257, by the way. <laughs> how many decisions do you know were made? How many verifiable miracles? And I'm like, verifiable, you know? I, I mean, that's not the way the Christian life works. You know, we're not supposed to be counting, you know, what good things God has done. I mean, there's, a, there's something to the testimony that's being released, you know. But could you imagine putting that on a resume? <clears throat> Went to Princeton Seminary, served at Community Presbyterian Church, raised the dead, okay. <laughs> and the interviewer would be going, oh, I see here that uh, you raised the dead. How many times did you do that? one time. Well, Jesus did it three times, four if you count his own resurrection. Uh, next applicant, you know. I guess. <laughs> and, and let's be honest, we all have a deep-seated feeling that death isn't natural. We weren't made to die. The grave was not part of God's original intention. We're supposed to live forever with the Lord. It's unnatural, and you know it's unnatural because you can look at all the negative emotions that accompany death, sorrow and tears and anxiety and panic and fear and resentment and anger and hatred towards God. Everybody, All this stuff happens that wasn't supposed to happen. Death wasn't supposed to be part of our situation. God warned us, don't eat of the wrong fruit because in that day you will die. And, and death has many different shades. It has many different ways that it touches our life. And we know how to bring comfort to those affected by death. God has an eternal life awaiting for us. In heaven, Revelation 21.4, there's no more pain, tears, sorrow, or death. So that's what heaven is. No more death. I had an intern at my first church, and and he didn't believe in the miracles. He'd argue, why didn't Jesus go to the Academy of the Blind and heal everybody? Why didn't Jesus show up at the leper colony and, 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 and heal everybody? How come Jesus didn't go to the cemeteries and raise everybody from the dead? And I said, well, first of all, Jesus came not to heal our bodies, but to heal our souls. And if he raised everybody from the dead, he wasn't really doing them any favors because they were still going to have to die again. Okay. He came to give us a life that would never stop. That would be a temporary fix to the problem of death. And in fact, he's opened the avenue to eternal life with God so that nobody has to die anymore. You don't die when you believe in Jesus Christ. You just transition to eternal life. The non-believer asks, why does God allow death? Well, think about it. <clears throat> if God didn't allow death then everybody who was under the curse of sin would live forever in a broken state of sinfulness. And we'd wish we could die, and we wouldn't be able to. So he said, you know what, I'm going to let you get out of this horrible predicament called sin and step into my eternal life that I have for you. And have you ever noticed when people have near-death experiences, 
<clears throat> now they often say they didn't want to come back. That's a regular statement. And what's mind-blowing is non-Christians. And you go, well, wait a minute. You were supposed to uh, have the fires of hell come up around your ankles and scare you back into life and live a correct life the rest of your days. You know, I try to figure that out. Well, maybe they're on their way towards the presence of God and they feel the peace of God. And it says that they're surrounded by the love of God. Okay? And what's God going to do? Okay, I'm sorry. You make the next left? I don't know. Some of us had near-death experiences, and they weren't good. You know, it's interesting. It isn't so much that they're getting tortured as there's an emptiness, a void. You don't matter anymore. No one's listening to you. Your life has no meaning. That's what a lot of people who have these near-death experiences share. I'm guessing that this child, this Jewish child, probably died and was happy to be in the presence of God. He probably didn't want to come back. And again, I want to say this. Jesus did not come to provide us a temporary reprieve from death. Okay, What Jesus has in mind for us is forever in the presence of God. And it's not based on anything that we did. It's based on his love for us. It's based on what he's done on behalf of us at the cross. But, but, but let's go into someplace really cool. Uh, this miracle, it, it shows Jesus' power, but do you notice that this mother had not asked for a miracle? Okay? She hadn't thrown herself at the Savior's feet, begging for the life of her son. She hadn't demonstrated great faith like the centurion in the story right before this one in, our, in, our, in Luke. Okay? The Lord took all the initiative in his conversation. This miracle was not a response to faith, but merely a response to grief and human misery. Jesus sees grief, human misery, and without human prompting, he, he releases divine compassion. I just want you to feel how the love of God works. All right? He's already inclined to extend his love for you. He doesn't demand a formula. There's no um, <clears throat> distribution of compassion based on a good deed quota. She didn't say the right word. She didn't do the right ritual. It was just a God who loves coming across the path of somebody who was hurting. Well, you know, automobile manufacturers, they'll take a perfectly fine car and crash it into a concrete barrier. And the airbags explode and the crash dummies recoil from the impact. And what they're trying to do is learn what they can from the impact to make life safer when real accidents occur. And if you and I are going to learn anything from the collision at Nain, when the wages of sin came out of town while the sacrifice for sins was going into town, it's this. Jesus faced down death with compassion for those affected by it. Revelations 1.18, I am the living one, I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever. I hold the keys of death in Hades. Who's dealt with death and hell? Jesus. And how do we see him operating? With compassion. In fact, somebody wasn't even aware it was available. Didn't ask for it. It was just Jesus deciding to release love. And as you and I journey closer to our collision with death, I think when, you, when we hold on to the words of promise, it's going to change the power that death has over us. You know, I still like being alive, and I'd like to finish off, you know, being a, a father and a grandfather and a great-grandfather and a <clears throat> great-great-grandfather and... <laughs> But, you know, I have a feeling there comes a point when you're like, I'm out of here. You know, I have been at the bedside of people who they wanted to go, okay, because they, they knew it was better on the other side. And, and that this is the fulfillment of their faith. I'm burying an 87-year-old on, on Saturday, and she was ready. She was wondering what was taking God so long, okay? And, and again... Jesus told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Okay. The centurion did, but the hopeless mother, 
She didn't believe it. And I wonder how often we identify with the widow. Okay, our hearts run out of hope. You ever been there? And the Lord, notice, he's not limited by the hopelessness of a situation. No, the Apostle Paul's words, death, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? Okay, it's removed because of the love of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, you know, we see his power in this miracle. We see the compassion of God in this miracle. And sometimes miracles, you know, there's people who don't believe in miracles. I believe in miracles, see them a lot. Sometimes, you know, we always try to figure out what category do they fit in. Okay, and, and you know, you can overthink things. I have seen miracles, and two days later I start to overthink it and rationalize it away. It was a miracle. But do you see what happens when you start to, to take control of what God's going to do? Sometimes he's protecting you. Sometimes he's revealing a spiritual truth. Sometimes, you know what, he, he, he just likes to sh show his love. But always he's concerned about you. And, and I want you to hear that he's concerned about you. You might be feeling alone. You might be feeling like you're struggling and you're losing. You might be wondering, what did I do, God? How come you're not? He is concerned. He is involved. And I think for us, when you and I ask for God to be involved, his promise is, okay, I will be. And then instead of expecting to see it this way, that way, or the other way, let him show you how he wants to reveal himself in your life. You know, the boy sits up and starts talking, and everybody's filled with fear, and they start glorifying God, and, you know, actually encounters with, the, with death have a way of directing our thoughts towards God. Back in the, the Civil War, General William Nelson, <clears throat> he was resting from the battle, and a couple of his guys were fighting and, and horsing around, and a shot went off from one of their guns, and it hit the general. And they ran around him, and they, what do we do, what do we do? And the general said, <clears throat> send for a clergyman. I wish to be baptized. So what happens when we die, get ready to die? All of a sudden, we want to get things right with God. And that's when the conversation, it, it, it gets real serious. Now, what if, if the general died 30 minutes later? What if you hit him right in the heart? You know, he wouldn't have had that opportunity. And, and, you know, again, we go to funerals and some morose thoughts. We start reexamining our priorities. And the only thing that's going to matter is whether or not you settled the, the, the relationship with God that he loved you through his son, Jesus Christ, that he did what was necessary for your forgiveness and salvation through Jesus Christ. That's the ticket. You don't earn it. You don't get the righteous quota above the unrighteous sin list. It's just, hey, I love you. I care about you. I want you to live with me forever. Here's the invitation. And Jesus, he goes on to defeat death for all time. Amen. You don't have to fear death. Okay? You don't have to fear. And I think if you live not having to fear death, you're going to live with a little more vibrancy. No, I'm not, not saying let's go bungee jumping and parachuting and, you know, investing in the stock market or anything like that, you know. And, but I am saying that, that maybe you can start taking a risk on life, starting to step out in your faith, starting to believe that God's going to show up, starting to ask for those miracles, okay, because... This world, it, we're supposed to bring heaven down to earth and lift earth up to heaven. You know, once after a child's funeral, we went back to the house. And, you know, you have your meal and everybody's, you know, talking and sharing stories. And this, this little girl comes walking through the door and she just comes on in, goes upstairs. And it was, it was her best friend had died. And so uh, pastor's like, whoa, what's going on? You know, and 
that was her best friend and she didn't go to the funeral. Uh, I wonder if anybody was ministered to her. She just lost her best friend. And so pastor goes up the stairs and peeks into the room and the little girl has a, a doll in both hands and pastor realizes, oh, this is her way of saying goodbye. And, and, and I really like this story because here's the deal. Do you know anybody in heaven? Do you ever talk to him? I do. No. Hey, Lucy, if you got any clout, can you help me out? Because I'm struggling <laughs> down here. Fred, thanks for blessing me, because believe it or not, those blessings are still touching my life. God, could you tell Dr. Jax hello for me? I miss him. I love him. But why do we talk to these people? Because they're still alive. Their legacy that touched us, but more than that, they're actually still alive in heaven, and we're going to see them again. And, and I guess this puts us in the right spot. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And it's not based on your behavior, it's based on his behavior on the cross. Okay? Okay. He goes to prepare a place for you because he wants to make sure where I am, you will be also. But by the way, you don't have to wait to, have, to get to heaven. He's already with you right now. I'll never forget one time I'm, I'm dreaming and I'm in the back row of my church and I'm praying in my dream and I woke up and I didn't lose a word from my dream prayer into my awakened state, prayer continued. And I think that's exactly how it's going to be. We're going to be in a conversation with God, and we're going to move right out of this realm into eternity where the arms of the Lord are going to reach around you. Friends, this is the compassion that God has for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we don't have to worry about death. I thank you that it's just a passageway to a more tangible relationship with you. And the most awe-inspiring thought of the evening is that you made heaven happen for us. We were hoping for it. We want to be there. We know we don't deserve it. But your love said, you will be with me. So tonight, with great humility and with great joy, we praise you. We thank you. May we take the message of eternal life to every person that crosses our path. Let us not be embarrassed. And if there's anybody here living in fear, tonight receive the word. Fear no more. I have saved you. I will never let you go. I got a place ready for you in heaven. Because I am the Lord of the living and the dead. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, we're going to have prayer warriors over here to, the, to your left. We've got communion over here to the right. Don, would you be willing to serve communion with tonight? Help us out. Um, Jim, would you be willing to serve communion? Uh, I just want you to taste the communion. And remember that this represents what Jesus did for you. I have a praise. Kim already brought it up. The doorkeeper of the house of the Lord, Judy, had the perfect surgery. No spread of the cancer. It's all gone. <laughs> Nothing wrong. You know, it was radical. Is when we saw her last night, her face had a glow. You know, I'm expecting to see somebody who just went through a cancer surgery, right? It's a glow. 
like death had been removed from her and she was already living. And that's happened for you too. Come get communion. Come get prayer. Amen.